I'm ready. Okay, so let's then start with the second talk today. It's a great pleasure to introduce Karim Sakala. Karim is a professor at the University of Michigan, and he's very well known in the area of uh, uh, satisfiability solving for his contributions. And he's one of the early contributors to the idea of conflict analysis for satisfiability solvers, even though he has already hit uh, uh, some points uh, that credit could go back a little further, but he's credited for, for this uh, concept back in 1996. And today he's going to tell us about uh, symmetry and quantification, a new approach to verify distributed protocols. So please carry on. Thank you, Albert. Um, I'm not really sure how this talk fits into the theme of this workshop. Um, still, uh, I think it's somewhat relevant in the sense that this it describes yet another application of SAT that I find, and I hope you will too, find uh, quite compelling. Uh, more than 10 years ago, we conjectured that the intractability of propositional SAT may be due in part to the presence of syntactic symmetries in the CNF instance. Finding and breaking those symmetries, we hoped, could provide an additional boost to CDCL algorithms, especially for unset instances. Well, that's not how things turned out. We did figure out how to find and break the symmetries, but failed to see any measurable boost in performance. The silver lining in all of this is that we learned a great deal about permutation groups, came up with the fastest algorithm for solving graph automorphism, and surprisingly, even canonical labeling. We also thought we could even resolve the issue of where the automorphism problem fits in the complexity hierarchy. Spoiler alert, we did not, but I'm open to discuss that with anyone who's interested. Uh, you can read all about it in the updated uh, symmetry and satisfiability chapter in the second edition of the Handbook of Satisfiability that should be out soon and that I'm shamelessly advertising here on my left. Uh, but here's an application which abounds with symmetry. It's been tackled by many researchers over many years, but almost entirely not in the context of class learning set. The application is most naturally encoded in the quantified first order logic and has been addressed very recently using quantified FOL reasoning in SMT solvers, but again, mostly ignoring its inherent symmetry. So this talk will show that there is a close connection between symmetry and quantification. That was the principal insight that yielded a simple and elegant solution this is still work in progress, and I will highlight at the end some of the open problems that still require further research. Oops. My slide is not switching now for some reason. Yeah, it's been all the time in the title slide. I'm, no, I, I now I wanna move from the title slide and I can't. So I, let me start it over. All right. We tried it in the break and it worked, right? Yes. Okay. Technical glitches. I'm gonna stop the share. Sorry about that. Okay, let's share again. And let's do this. Okay, is it switching now? Not yet. We're oh, still seeing you. Because I haven't shared. Okay, hang on a second. Need to share the screen again. Okay, now something is coming up. Okay. That's the PowerPoint. Now we can do this. And now I can do this. And now it's switching, right? That's the second slide, I suppose. You see the second slide now? Okay. Yes. All right, sorry about that glitch. So to set the stage for what I'm gonna talk about today, let's quickly review some of the basic ingredients we need to solve this problem. Um, given a software program, a hardware design, a protocol spec, Etc. we encode it as a finite transition system in some suitable logic over a set of state variables X. We will use I, T, and P 
to denote the predicate that's the predicates that specify the initial state, the transition relation, and the safety property. This is the modeling step of model checking. Now, the checking step analyzes this model to either show that P holds, it is violated, or it may fail to provide an answer. Now, checking amounts to finding an inductive invariant for the transition system, and there are many ways it can be done. For example, Starting from I, the initial state, we can successively derive states that are reachable after one step and two steps, et cetera, until we find all of the reachable states, R. Um, at that point, we can uh, reduce checking to determining if I and R satisfy P by showing that the set queries I and not P, as well as R and not P, are unset. If either of these queries is satisfiable, then P is violated. Now, typically, this is done. Um, using BDDs, uh, but it's not scalable in general uh, because R is in, in general intractable to find that way. Uh, the alternative is to find an inductive invariant without computing R, okay? So in this scenario, let's assume that P holds, i.e. that R implies P, and let's assume further that there are states in P that can transition to states that are not in P. In other words, that the query P and T and not P prime is set. This means that P is not closed under T, it is not inductive, even though it is safe. To make it inductive, we need to find a strengthening assertion, call it A, that together with P is an over approximation of R and is inductive, i.e. starting from any state in A and P, we remain in A and P in the next state. This will yield the inductive invariant that we are lo looking for, which is uh, equal to A and P that proves that P holds. The question is though, how do we find this A? And uh, to date, the most effective approach for doing this is incremental, in, incremental induction using the IC3PDR algorithm. Now describing IC3PDR is outside the scope of the stock, but I will sketch a bit later its most important step and show how we can modify it to take advantage of symmetry. Uh, my group has been developing safety checking tools for hardware and software using incremental induction coupled with a syntactic abstraction that over approximates data variables and operations as we hunt for what we call control-centric bugs. The latest incarnation of these tools is AVR, which was the overall winner of the 2020 hardware model checking competition, and sorry about this plug. But now that we have a big hammer, let's find a big nail to hammer. And the big nail came in the form of verifying infinite state unbounded protocols, also known as parameterized systems. This application was brought to our attention by colleagues who work in distributed systems and who held the view that verification of such systems cannot be done using model checking, since it is known that model checking is, quote, unscalable. Instead, some variant of interactive theorem proving that involves manual generation of, induct of candidate in inductive invariants seems to be necessary. We took this as a challenge and proceeded to figure out a way to prove them wrong but we needed to understand what infinite state protocols are all about and why they are hard to verify, verify algorithmically. So here is the simplest possible example of an infinite state protocol. It consists of an unbounded number of servers and clients. The state variables are represented as relations over the server and client domains. The unary relation semaphore of S indicates if server S is available. The binary relation link CS indicates if client C is connected to server S. Um, now, initially, all servers are available and none of the clients are connected to any server. And here I'm using the uh, TLA plus notation that Lamport you know, devised to describe you know, the uh, logic here, okay? Um, the transitions in this protocol are expressed as actions. So connecting client C to server S requires that the server is available. And if so, sets the link between C and S to true and the semaphore of S to false. This is viewed as an atomic action that leaves all other state variables unchanged. So here is the state after executing the action connect C3S2 and the action connecting C1S1. I hope you can see the animation over here that I spent a lot of time doing. Next, the other action is uh, the, to disconnect a client from a server. This action requires that client C is currently connected to server S and executing the action uh, causes the link between C and S to be false and the semaphore to return to true. This again, all other state variables are remain unchanged. 
Um, so executing a disconnect C3S2 results in this state. Now, the safety property that must be satisfied by this protocol is specified by this quantified formula, which basically says that at most one client can be connected to any server at any given time. It turns out that this property is invariant, but it's not inductive. And adding the strengthening assertion A given by the quantified formula shown here makes it an inductive, uh, uh, makes A and P inductive, proving that P holds. The assertion A basically says that the existence of a connection between client C and server S implies that S is unavailable. So the goal here is to devise an algorithmic procedure that derives such quantified assertions or to show that P fails. That's the problem. Now, it turns out that this is not a new problem. There's a sizable body of literature that has examined it over the years, which basically concludes that at least for safety properties, the proof of correctness can be determined by analyzing a small, finite instance which is then generalized to any size. There are differences in the details, but all previous attacks on this problem are based on the notion that the behavior of an unbounded parameterized system can be inferred by examining a relatively small instance of it. This is just a sampling of the literature on the so-called cutoff methods. So armed with our finite state hardware model checker AVR, we proceeded to build the I4 protocol verification system. Our entry into the space was through the IV language and verifier developed by Ken McMillan when he was at Microsoft Research. Now he's a colleague of uh, Moshe, I think, in Austin. Um, no, not in Austin, I'm sorry, you're a trice. <laughs> the I4 system reads an IV description of a protocol and proceeds to create a small finite instance of it based on a user specified size. This is then converted into a logic circuit in the Verilog hardware description language, which is fed to our verifier AVR. If the verification fails, AVR produces a counterexample, which can then be used to debug the protocol description. Otherwise, AVR produces a finite inductive invariant for the given size, which is passed to a generalization procedure that produces a corresponding universally quantified invariant. This step is quite ad hoc, since it presumes that universal quantification is the correct generalization of the finite invariant. In any case, this quantified invariant is then passed to the IV verifier to determine if it is inductive in the unbounded case. If it is, verification succeeds. If not, the next step depends on whether the property itself or the assertion produced by AVR is the reason for failure. Failure due to the property is handled by manually increasing the instance size and repeating the process. Failure due to one or more of the assertions is handled by strengthening the assertions in another ad hoc refinement step followed by rerunning the IV unbounded check. We developed I4 as a proof of concept for the idea of generalizing finite invariants that are automatically generated by an existing finite state model checker, which was not, which was not done earlier. So how well did this work? So here's a set of 29 protocols from a variety of sources. They are similar to the uh, client server I mentioned earlier in that they are all based on unbounded sets of distinct but fully interchangeable and symmetric elements. Uh, I4 manages to solve 13 of them, some fairly quickly, some taking significant time. The problem though is that this result, the resulting invariance uh, in the columns uh, labeled I and V, the size of the invariant, tended to be quite large compared to known human generated invariants. This may not seem all that significant considering that the process is almost fully automatic. However, it is desirable in these cases to have small invariants that can be easily understood by inspection. A more serious problem is that I4 is not robust. In many cases, it fails because of the ad hoc procedures for generalization refinement. In particular, as we see later, it fails on the bottom 11 protocols because they require strengthening assertions that cannot be expressed with just universal quantification. So the rest of my talk describes how we solve all of these issues. Um, the solution I'm about to describe has been implemented in a tool called IC3PO, which is an extension of IC3 for proving protocol properties. We just learned that the, proper has, the paper has been accepted uh, for presentation in May at the NASA Symposium, Formal Methods Symposium. And it will be presented by my PhD student, Aman Goyle, who is in the audience and will help me answer any questions that you may have. So I'm going to describe IC3PO through an example that covers most of the steps it carries out to produce a quantified strengthening assertion. This example is due again to Ken McMillan and written in the IV language I mentioned earlier. It describes a simple consensus protocol. Let's go forth through it. Um, I will be describing this in the TLA plus language because I find it a lot more uh, uh, precise. So we have 
a toy consensus uh, protocol that is based on three unbounded sets of cons constants, nodes, quorums, and values. The state variables are binary, a binary relation vote, which is true for a given node value pair, if the node has voted for that value, and a unary predicate decision, which is true for a given value if that value has been decided. Quorums are defined as subsets of nodes such that each pair of quorums has a non-empty intersection. I will further discuss quorums in a later slide. The protocol has two actions, cast vote to indicate that node N is voting for value V and decide to indicate that the value V has been decided on, uh, decided on by the nodes in the quorum Q. Again, I will elaborate on these actions a little later, but want to highlight that they are described in terms of some auxiliary non-state quantified of expressions. Uh, I, I'm showing them here in green, did not vote and chosen hat. These, uh, uh, the different roles played by these different variables will be highlighted in, in my slides by displaying them using different font colors, font colors. Black for state variables, that's vote and decision, and green for the auxiliary variables, and blue for the actions which act as inputs. Finally, I, T, and P are given as quantified formulas stating the conditions in the initial state, the protocol's possible actions, and the required safety property, namely that if a decision is made on two different values, then they must be the same. That's consensus. Now, the assumptions under all of this is that the domain constants are unordered and indistinguishable, i.e. each domain is fully symmetric. And secondly, the logic underlying this is quantified first order logic with the empty theory. We don't do arithmetic here. Uh, but before we get into the inner workings of ICTPO, we need to introduce some notation uh, in order to follow the story. So what I'm showing you here is in mono font, uh, the names of the domains, node, quorum, and value. And if I wanna talk about them in the finite case, I would put a subscript. So node sub three is a domain of nodes with three named distinct but interchangeable constants. I'm calling them here arbitrarily N1, N2, and N3. Um, the, if I'm talking about a particular size instance, for example, an instance that has three nodes, three quorums, and two values, I will use those as arguments to the various predicates in the, uh, in the transition system. So I, T, and P on three nodes, three quorums, and three values are as shown here. Now, when we generate an inductive invariant, an assertion, uh, I should say, we the, the discover it based on a size instance. So here, A sub 332 is an assertion that was found on a 332 instance. And in this case, when we apply it to a 332 instance, it will be obviously inductive because that's how we found it. But we can also take that assertion that we found on a 332 instance and see if we can apply it to a larger instance, four nodes, four quorums, and two values, okay? And the same thing uh, would be true for the invariant. So I'm gonna be talking about this a little bit later, uh, this notation. If it's not clear, it should be clear a little later on. Now, I mentioned that quorums are defined as subsets of nodes, making them a dependent domain. And the domain over here, uh, let's say, is a node domain of three nodes. So there are eight subsets of three. And a quorum on these that satisfies the non-intersection uh, uh, axiom would probably be this. There are others, but you know this is the one that actually covers all of the values of node three. Um, now, this is actually a very clever way to specify majority, right? Uh, but to add also symmetry to it, we can just pick these three subsets of two elements each um, that are symmetric majorities. And we can call them Q12, Q13, and Q23, and essentially infer a quorum set that has only three quorums in it that correspond to the three nodes. The number of quorums will obviously depend on the number of nodes. It's basically n choose n over two ceiling, something like that, okay? So the number of quorums will increase as the size of the node set increases. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about symmetry, we say um, there are some permutations that leave the object we're, look, we'll, we're talking about invariant. Here we have full symmetry. If we have a node, uh, uh, sort of three, no, of three nodes, there are six symmetries, six, six permutations that should leave everything the same. And we can then look at the, uh, at the action of that symmetry group on the quorums, for example. So the quorum one, two would 
then permute as shown here. And we look at the other forums and they will permute as well. Um, finally, what I'm trying to do with this one here is to show that the node permutations induce permutations on the forums as well. But the, the forum permutations have to follow the node permutations to, for consistency. Um, now a little bit about me. So when I'm confronted with a problem that's outside my knowledge base, I always find it helpful to encode it into something that my brain can process. And my brain is wired to process logic circuits. So in the next few slides, I will show you uh, some circuit diagrams that represent this protocol. So here is the first one. This is the circuit diagram that corresponds to the action of casting, vote, casting a vote by node one to value one. Uh, we have a flip-flop here that is the state variable node vote of n1 v1 and it will become true if the following condition is satisfied that we have a cast vote n1 v1 and that node one has not voted before so that signal here in green is like a wire in a combination of circuit that says um for all v uh, i did not vote for any value node one has not voted for any value um, we can then Repeat this for other values, V2 and V3, and for other nodes. So that's the action of casting a vote. The action of deciding on a value is a bit more uh, involved. So here, again, we have a flip-flop towards the right that is saying, here is the decision on value 1. And that decision to value 1, uh, the, the decision becomes true. Value 1 is chosen if the following condition is satisfied, that the enabling condition on that max. Uh, so let's look at that. Uh, we have, I'm not sure if I can use my cursor here. Suppose that uh, all the nodes in quorum one, two, which are nodes N1 and N2 have voted for value one, then we can then uh, decide to make decision on value one true, okay? And here what I'm showing is a signal, again, a combinational signal that says all nodes in this quorum have voted for this value. And so we can then make the decision of that value. But there are other choices for how to make that decision. And because there are other quorums, so this output of this OR gate is there exists a quorum such that you know all members of that quorum voted for that value. So we put all of this together and then we have this whole circuit diagram that describes the logic circuit for the protocol with three nodes, three quorums, and three values. Um, this part here is the part that updates the states of votes. And this part here is the state uh, is the part that updates the state for decisions. And the last part is the property that says only one of those decisions can be true for the property to hold. Now, <clears throat> based on the theorem, the ancient theorem that a picture is worth a thousand words, this picture very clearly converts the inherent symmetry of the protocol. We have heard in several talks over the past several weeks that understanding instance structure may be key to explain the complexity defined performance of CDCL solvers. But what you're looking at here is structure galore. It does not need much effort to expose it, okay? Um, but we also need to look at equations. And this is the definition of the transition relation for this protocol um, for a three, three sized instance, three nodes, three quorums, three values. It corresponds to a a uh, formula, a uh, disjunction of, et of 18 uh, literals, uh, uh, nine for cast vote and nine for decide. Um, the question now is, can we, uh, what, what happens if we permute this uh, uh, formula using, and I need to move my, Never mind. I cannot see the uh, permutation on my screen unless I move this. Yeah, suppose that we apply the permutation shown here on the right, which is I'm going to uh, map N1 to N3, N3 to N2, and N2 back to N1, corresponding quorums uh, map uh, uh, as shown earlier. And I will also map V1 to V2, V2 to V3, and V3 to V1. This is just one permutation of these symmetric domains. What happens if I do that? So let's take the first disjunct here, which is This always happens, I think, when I touch uh, when I touch Zoom. I need to stop this now. Excuse me. And restart it. We need software to verify this. 
Are we seeing the same thing? Yes. But now I think you can see the animation. Now it's uh, the animation is coming up. Yes, yes. There's a there's a bug between Zoom and uh, PowerPoint and you know Windows and you know everything. So it's we take, yeah, we take <laughs> exactly we take test vote n one v one and we apply that permutation. So n one becomes n two, and uh, I'm sorry, n one becomes n three according to that permutation, and v one becomes v two. Is that a new literal? No. It is actually that one. We can take another uh, disjunct, say the bottom one here, decide quorum two, three, V three, we permute it, we get decide Q one, V one. It's another disjunct. And in fact, when you apply all of this, you discover that T and in fact, I and P are invariant under all permutations of the domain constants. This is what we mean by the symmetry with respect to these domain constants. So now I'm going to take a slight uh, detour into it's describing what's happening in IC3 because IC3 is our uh, tool for discovering these uh, uh, inductive invariants. So suppose that we are in the middle of, of finding a inductive invariant, and uh, we have so far found that there is a counter example to induction ending in a not in not p basically, and we are at frame i plus one where we found that there is a cube s that is the beginning of this. Uh, partial execution that ends up in not p. Um, and the question that we want to ask is, uh, if can we eliminate this because you know it, it's not reachable from an earlier frame? So we issue the uh, query f i and t and s prime. Is that satisfiable? If it is satisfiable, then we have to continue going back and perhaps end up reaching i and then showing that there is a counterexample. But in this case, it is unreachable. Right? It's unsat. So we can block it in frame i plus one, meaning we move the frame this way. This is done by essentially negating the cube to create a clause, not s, which we then add to frame i plus one. This is basically how the process goes in incremental induction. So now let's look at a specific uh, 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 cube s in, this con in the context of our, um, our example here. So the cube here is s equals vote n2v1 and vote n2v2. It's unreachable, so we're going to create a clause, which is the negation. Um, and then we say, is that the only clause that we can actually learn at this point? Um, since this clause has uh, equivalent symmetry equivalent uh, clauses to it, let's see if we can find all of those. So we have uh, nodes and we have values in this clause. Let's permute the clause on nodes. And so we get this table of permutations. Uh, only, uh, the, the, so the node permutation basically either generate new clauses that are distinct or they just uh, uh, reorder the uh, literals in the clause. In this case, we see that um, we, we end up with three distinct clauses here. Uh, in fact, one of them is uh, talking about N1, another is talking about N2, and another is talking about N3. We can take them each at a time and see if we can uh, then permute the values. Something similar happens over here. We get three versions of this clause on node one when we permute the values. And we do the same thing for the other two. Long story short, this original, original clause that we started with that was talking about node two with voting for V1 and V2 has uh, eight symmetric equivalents. So we have an orbit of that clause that is nine clauses long. Now, this allows us then to boost the uh, learning. So we start with this uh, cube, which has these equivalent cubes that if the solver happened to pick one of them, you know, we would have gotten a, 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 similar, a similar result here. In fact, these similar cubes to S behave the same way. They reach Fi plus one, and they cannot be reached from Fi. So we can learn all of them at the same time. Okay? This will tremendously speed up the convergence, and we can learn all of them at the same time. But more importantly than that is that we can use this orbit to, to infer an, uh, a quantifier that describes all these nine clauses at the same time. This is done syntactically. I don't have time to explain it in this talk. Um, it's in the paper, and it will be in the presentation in May. But you can look at the syntactic structure of that clause and that's highlighted here. 
and say all of its uh, orbit can be described by this quantified formula. Okay? For all n, for all v1, v2, if the v's are distinct, then it implies the clause, which you can turn it around and to say for all n, for all v1, v2, if I voted for v1 and v2, then v1 must be equal to v2. Just trust me on this one that this is done syntactically. Now, to prove that it is actually the same, we can instantiate this quantified formula. It's got uh, three nodes in it, a variable on three nodes, a uh, and two variables on three values. So there's 27 instantiations. Uh, a lot of them end up being true because the consequent v1 equals v2 is uh, is false. Is, is true. I'm sorry. Uh, when 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 the when the instantiation of the two variables v1 v2 are the same, and a lot of the others are redundant. So anyway, you end up after doing this, discovering that this table of instantiations is identical to the closed orbit. So the quantified formula is an exact compact representation of the closed orbit. That's an important kind of point to make here. Let's take a look at another clause. This one has a uh, not decision on V3. And then we have three similar looking uh, uh, literals chosen at Q1, 2, V2, and Q1, 3, V2, et cetera. So we can do, we do the same thing. We can, we have to permute the values. We permute the values and we end up with three distinct versions of this clause, one on V1, one on V2, one on V3. But now when we try to permute, so we can describe this with just, so the um, quantification of the uh, variables on different uh, sorts, on different domains can be done orthogonally because they are not permutable across these domains. The values cannot permute with nodes and the quorums cannot permute with values. So we can, these three clauses, the distinct ones can be described with this quantified formula on values. And then if I try to permute the quorums, uh, let's look at permuting Q13 and Q23 here. And it changed the order of the last two terms, but it's the same clause. So we did not create a new distinct clause here. And in fact, if you try the other permutations of quorums, you do not, you do not dis discover any new uh, uh, clauses. So permuting the quorums here did not change the uh, clause. And that is because we have all of them. Remember, we have a quorum of three, uh, a, a, a quorum uh, set of three quorums, and all three quorums are appearing uh, identically in this in this clause. So we end up um, <clears throat> um, with the same clause, and we can then summarize it with an existential quantifier on quorums. So this now is for all v in value, not this decision on v, or exist quorum such that etc. So this naturally just falls out from doing the symmetry. And if you substitute for uh, the definition of uh, chosen at, uh, you get this rather interesting uh, 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 formula that has quantifier alternations for all on value, exist on quorum, for all on nodes. We didn't have, have to do anything special on this. This was all done syntactically. OK, now. Any questions about this? Maybe I, I, I should ask uh, if there are any questions about this so far. You can ask questions in the chat or um, mute yourself. And if not, you can continue. I can continue. So I have chosen to illustrate symmetry boosting and quantifier inference using these two clauses because they I end up being in the uh, final strengthening assertion. Okay. But this process is done throughout the incremental induction. These are the ones that survive at the end. And so this is now the invariant that we have discovered on a 3 3 p instance. Okay? Here is the property. Here is the uh, uh, first strengthening assertion. And here's the second one. OK? And the idea was, why did I choose three nodes, three quorums, and three values? You know, what was special about those? And now the answer for nodes and quorums is easy. Uh, because if I had that domain of just two nodes, I would only end up with one quorum. And since the protocol seems to want to talk about two quorums and non-intersection and so on, to get two quorums, I need at least three values. But the question is harder to answer for values because I, I, I only see two values in, in the thing that I'm doing over here. Um, and so why not just try with two values? So let's try it with two values. So this now shows the invariant that we get when we derive it from an instance that has three nodes, three quorums, and two values. And it is kind of like the previous one, except for this one here, 
where the first strengthening assertion looks different. It's got an exists V in the version of two values, and it's got uh, for all on the, on the other one. So which is correct? Um, well, the only way to answer this question is to test it out. So here I'm showing the uh, uh, domain of nodes, you know, as I increase the number of uh, nodes and the no domain of values. The quorums are dependent on nodes, so we don't have to show that, you know, we don't have to have a 3D diagram here. So if I run an experiment on three nodes and two values, and I discovered this invariant that I just showed you, the question is, is this going to generalize to any size? Uh, and we can do it here. I'm saying multidimensional induction in quotes because I want to ask a question of the experts in the audience a little later as to what to call this, because I'm not sure what to call it. So we're going to fix the values to two and increase the nodes to four and the quorums to four and check it on that size instance. So check the three, three, two invariant on a larger size instance that has four nodes and four quorums. And it's, it checks, it's inductive. But if I try to do it on keep the number of nodes and columns the same, but increase the number of values from two to three, it doesn't check. It's not inductive. So I know that it's not going to generalize. So how about then increasing the number of values to three and try that, trying that again. And if we do this now, we will discover that first set of invariants that I showed you, the uh, strengthening assertions I showed you earlier. And if we increase the number of nodes, it checks. If we increase the number of values, it checks. And so it looks like we've got what we needed. We derived an invariant on a 333 instance that we can now claim is valid for any size instance. Now you might think there's something fishy going on over here. Okay. Here's mathematical induction. I don't have to spend time explaining this. Okay. We got a thing that we want to prove for all uh, n greater than or equal to b, where b is our base. And so we need to show that it's true at B, and then we have to show that it's true for every K greater than or equal to B, to show that for every K greater than or equal to B, if it's true at that K, it's true at the next K. So it looks like this, right? We cannot say anything before B, but we can say it's true for everything at B or greater. Now, what we're doing here is, um, I'm simplifying here with a single domain. We have an invariant that was de de derived on a, a size B instance and applied to size B. So it's true by, uh, 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 so it's, it's invariant by definition. It's inductive by definition. So this is my side B. It's in based on B applied to B and uh, it's inductive. And then I increase the domain size to B plus one, but I keep the clause. The clause here is what I call um, phi sub B. The C phi sub B is based on just an instance of size B. So that didn't change. And so, and, and, and we find that this second one is, induct is inductive. So all we did is we showed that it's true at B, and we showed that if it's true at B, it's true at B plus one, not for all K greater than or equal to B. And then we conclude that it's true for all N. What is this? I'm calling it symmetric induction, but if somebody has a better idea or what's going on, it's correct empirically, but we haven't really proved it yet. So I'm almost done here. Um, uh, we ran IC3PO on all the 29 protocols I showed you earlier. And besides comparing it against I4, we compared it against two verifiers that perform quantified FOL reasoning, UPDR, which tries to infer universal inductive invariance, and FOL IC3, which uses logic separators to infer both universal and existential inductive invariance. I'm showing here the 18 protocols where proof, whose proof did not require existential quantification and the derived strengthening assertion. And the most significant bit here is that IC3PO solves all of them in the least amount of time, and its performance is generally predictable. Okay. Now, uh, the remaining uh, the results for the remaining eleven protocols whose proof requires invariance with both universal and existential quantifiers are shown here. And since the only meaningful comparison is between IC3PO and FOL IC3, I'll remove the results for I4 and UPDR. So I'm going to get rid of those, and then I'm going to tell you about these symbols I have here. The symbol. And it says that the IC3PO assertion that was found includes quantifier alternations. This one says that it has auxiliary variables. And this one shows that the formula it produces is an uh, FOL formula that is not an EPR. It has uh, uh, quantifier alternation cycles. So except for the two protocols, for two protocols, IC3PO is quite fast in several cases, much faster than FOL IC3. 
it also solves all 11 protocols while FOLIC3 solves uh, nine. In all cases, it produces a smaller invariant on average less than a third the size and almost the same size as the human generated invariant. Uh, one statistic that seems to show an edge for FOLIC3 is that the number of SMT calls it uses is, uh, is, is the number of SMT calls smaller than IC3PO, uh, which is skewed by just the last protocol. But we must keep in mind that this is an apples to oranges comparison because the SMT calls in IC3PO are uh, uh, quantifier free, whereas in the one in, in FOLIC3 they are quantified. So these are obviously observations that must be taken with a grain of salt because they're in the context of this particular set of protocols. But it seems that inferring the quantifier shape based on simp and simple statistics, simple syntactic symmetry arguments gives I3PO an advantage of producing with very little effort, compact invariants that if necessary, uh, in include complex quantifier alternations uh, that other approaches struggle to find. So this connection between symmetry and quantification is a perfect example of looking at the problem structure, in this case, symmetry, and seeing if it can lead to a simple, efficient, and elegant solution. Okay. So um, I'm almost done. A couple of weeks ago, my sidekick, Aman, introduced me to the world of smart contracts, in particular, this Cardano multi-signature protocol that looks very much like the protocols we saw earlier. You don't need to dwell on the details. This is just another parameterized transition system defined on a set of unbounded symmetric domains. It has a transition relation captured by this diagram. It has several safety properties specified. So I read the papers describing this protocol, which tells me, which he tells me it's also used in Bitcoin and Ethereum and so on. I don't know much about this stuff. He coded it in TLA plus and ran ICP on it, obtaining these two strengthening assertions in about 30 seconds. So I'm gonna switch now my browser and show you something. Um, so with this, stop and the slideshow. And the slideshow, how does it end the slideshow here? Okay. And, and then show you this screen now. Do you see the screen now? So uh, we don't know. Do you, do you see the screen? Yeah, sorry, I was mute. Yeah, we can see it. Uh, it's got a lot of colored text in it, lots of text. Yes. So the, 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 the smart people at uh, uh, Cardano actually proved this using uh, their own theorem prover uh, called Agda. And so we, we don't understand really this. I, I'm just showing you this to show you that perhaps we can actually automate this, OK? That, that's kind of the idea is model checking can still probably work on this. So now I can go back to my last slide here and uh, share screen on this. And uh, not, not from the beginning. No, 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 don't do it from the beginning. <laughs> Too many clicks here. I need to go to the end here. That was a bad idea to switch. Um, okay, so we're gonna do it from here. And switch it. So, um, I sketched basically the idea, the basic idea behind compact quantified strengthening assertions for protocols uh, by syntactically boosting a learn clause to its symmetry orbit and syntactically uh, encoding that orbit with a quantified clause whose quantifier shape includes the required universal ex existential quantifier. I also sketched a symmetric induction procedure that converges, but I'd like to discuss that. And we have good encouraging validation on this experimentally. Um, I necessarily skip some details such as various optimizations um, and also the approach can be extended to other things other than symmetry. And finally, you know, I am working with one of the um, uh, smartest uh, uh, Simon's fellows, Kathleen Fasekas, to see if we can show 
the decidability of quantified FOA reasoning when the domains are symmetric, fully symmetric. She's making very good progress on that. Um, if you're interested, the uh, paper and the code for FIC3PO is available online. And now I will stop and uh, happy to answer any questions you may have or delegating the question to a man if I can't find, if I, if I don't know the answer. Thank you very much. Thanks. I applaud for everyone. So we have uh, time for questions, either for Karim or for his student. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So I, I'm missing something in the big picture. So the problem of uh, this kind of protocol verification is, is known for many years to be undecidable, unbounded protocols. So are you attacking an undecidable problem or is this a fragment that somehow is decidable? That's what I missed here. Um, thanks for that question. That always comes up. You know, there is always in every one of those papers about parameterized protocol, they refer to this two page paper by apt saying showing undecidability of parameterized systems. Apt and Cosin, yeah. Yeah, I believe that we are decidable in the very specific fragment of uh, domains that are completely symmetric and we don't have interference between them. So that's what we're trying to show that even that, that for that very specific class that it will be decidable. So I, I think we need to separate, you know, the, the efficiency issue with this bigger question. Is this, have we identified an interesting decidable class? Because this kind of undecidability has been kind of dogging us and people have tried to identify decidable classes, but the challenge is to make them decidable and still interesting. And so I would try to encourage you to try to, to nail it. You know, have we find an interesting but decidable class for protocol verification? So we're just scratching the surface. This is new to, uh, terrain for us. And, and, and a lot of the protocols that we've looked at, um, you know, I mentioned in the future work, we're looking at, there are other things besides symmetry of the domains. For example, uh, Paxos, which is uh, the uh, Lamport consensus protocol, has symmetric domains, but it has also a, an order domain called a ballot, okay? Which uh, we are working on to see if it can fit within this uh, uh, um, kind of subclass, if you will. Um, we believe that it still will remain decidable, but I can't really say for sure. I'm not a theoretician. So I really am leaning on people who are more smart than me in theory to see if there is a check, uh, actually a class of problems that is large enough to be interesting for which we can show this other ability. But I'll, I'll give you a slogan that you should try to use, stealing from, stealing from Hall. Inside every unbounded protocol, there is a bounded protocol wishing to be, to be born. Hmm. You know, Tony Hall said, inside every large program, there is a small program trying to, to be born. So yeah. we can take I mean, a variation of it. I mean, the, the thing that I really feel a little weak on is, is showing that convergence that we're showing because of symmetry. There's a notion of saturation that as you increase the bound, you don't see new behaviors. So there is a connection between symmetry and induction. And, uh, you know, I think looking at that would be very interesting. Okay, there's some discussion going on in the chat. Uh, William Schultz asked whether the benchmarks for IC3PO you presented are multi-threaded. Are the underlying algorithms parallelizable? Uh, this is a question for Aman. Aman, can you unmute and speak? Yeah, he wrote an answer, but it would be nice if he could unmute. Yes, uh, so these benchmarks are represented uh, not as a uh, executable programs, but as abstract state machine descriptions in quantified first order logic in a domain specific language called IV. It is much like TLA plus. So basically uh, it's uh, at a level uh, higher at the protocol level and not at a system level implementation level. So, but uh, um, it is, uh, it could be thought of, uh, we can extract a state machine out of it and uh, executable C code as well. There is some work on that, mm -hmm. but uh, not directly. Thank you, Aman. Any other questions? Um, so I have a comment following Mo Moshe's um, mm -hmm. question. Uh, we, we did look at this this problem space for a while and uh, 
our conclusion, our partial results so far is that uh, the connection between symmetry and uh, the existence of an invariant is sort of related to Ashcroft invariants, which are these kind of old notions of invariance in which you are universally quantifying over uh, thread IDs in concurrent programs, but it could be kind of component IDs in, uh, um, in, in distributed systems. But in terms of decidability, the, the one decidable, uh, interesting decidable subfragment that we found were uh, monadic groups. So if you, you want universal, universally quantified invariants that uh, the predicates involved in them only relate to the local state of a process to a global, um, to, to the global state. So they're monadic in this sense, then uh, you have decidability. Beyond this, the rest of decidability results are of the type of boundedness, bounded tree with things like that, that uh, do not correspond syntactically to the, to the actual processes. We cannot kind of link them, but we can link them to, to the shape of the invariance, uh, which is unintuitive in some sense. Uh, would I appreciate any uh, links to uh, some of this literature? Uh, I'll, I can send you one on, uh, on Discord. Thank you. Um, I, I think, so every time I, 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 I hear uh, Moshe, you know, every time I hear undecidability, it seems like, you know, that's the end of the discussion. No, 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 that's not what I meant at all. I mean, look, we are trying to solve intractable problems in right, general. Right. Right. So I'm perfectly okay. I just want to understand. It's okay yes. to say we have a practical approach, you know. Right. I mean, Byron Cook has done all his work on termination, right? So it's okay to have real working algorithm and undecidable problem. That's not a problem. By the way, all of these were done where were actually verified in the unbounded case. So all of the things that were found in a bounded case turned out to be actually valid in the unbounded case as well. Any other questions? I have one question myself, if I may. You um, may. Yeah. So. One word that you always, I mean, I'm not an expert in, in, in uh, symmetry handling for, for solving, but uh, the word that people use is symmetry breaking. And you were using here symmetry boosting. In, in, right. in some sense, you want to exploit the symmetry to get more inference uh, right. instead, right. Of, instead of uh, breaking the symmetry and right. then cut the space in some way. Right. So right. are these two approaches uh, dual of one another or are they... Uh, Okay. So th okay. that's one question I have. And if I may ask the second one, so it, it's that, so this is also trying to understand a little bit when you do the quantifier inference, mm -hmm. uh, when you want to get these invariants in, written in first order logic, is the goal to have a human readable invariant or is it more than what you want is a compact representation to use in a different, okay. uh, in a different model? Okay. Yeah, let me answer the first question. So symmetry breaking was uh, essentially, uh, uh, you know, invented to solve the intractability of large, you know, uh, 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 CNF set instances, where uh, we thought that because of symmetry, uh, you know, many uh, uh, unset subtrees, you know, could be traversed multiple times unnecessarily. So that's why we needed to break the symmetries. And finding the symmetries of the formulas was a big project. I mean, that's where I got myself into solving, you know, graph isomorphism and all of that stuff. Um, so yes, in that case, you know, you want to break the symmetries in order to reduce the amount of search. Uh, in this case, uh, we're talking about very small uh, uh, instances. So, you know, two, three, four, five. So uh, we don't want to break symmetries here. What we want to do is we want to uh, 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 infer from them a quantified form that will generalize to unbounded sizes, to, to an unbounded domain. So having the symmetric clauses, all of them in the orbit, so the, the, the quantifier, uh, uh, the quantified formulas are actually representing uh, orbits of any object that you have. In this case, the object are clauses. If you don't have all of them, then you don't have a quantified form that captures that, okay? So that's that. So it's not meant to uh, uh, be uh, uh, just compact. Uh, I4 did not do this, and it generated way larger invariants that were very hard to look at. These ones are, because of the symmetry, much smaller. And when you look at them, they look like human generated. In fact, some of them are better than human generated uh, because they take advantage of the structure in the problem. Um, what was the second question? 
It was that. Whether what is the goal of uh, quantifier inference? Is it to the, the goal is to find a, 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 a quantified invariant that will work in the unbounded uh, domain. So we yeah, want okay. To Okay, thank you. Yeah, that answers we, 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 we infer it from a finite instance, and then we converge it to show that it actually, the, the final one that we get will be uh, an invariant for the unbounded case. Yes. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're very much reaching the time. If there are more questions, it's a time to do them. If there are no more questions, then I will ask uh, everybody to applaud and thank Karim again. So, and thank you very everybody for joining and keep uh, keep an eye on the schedule for a meeting next week in the workshop. And thank you very much, Karim, again. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much.